today I wanted to, the readings for today are uh, intended to give you some flavor or taste of uh, how, you know, papers and studies using social network analysis look like. And uh, it's, it's a combination of the theories and um, uh, ideas that were developed. So sort of the content uh, that's been developed in social network analysis, uh, as well as some of the measures and, and uh, methodological approaches uh, that have been developed. Okay. Um, uh, who, who do we have as the presenters? Uh, the first one on um, ground invaders, strength of repose. Uh, it's not that he's one of the presenters, but I don't know uh, which paper. Uh, Matt, which paper are you presenting uh, this time? Yeah, I've got the spicy one. I've got the romantic partnerships one. Oh, okay. That's going to be fun. You know what? Uh, in the interest of time, if there's uh, if there was nobody who signed up for this, I'll I'll just um, you know go through my slides and, and we can have a discussion about um, the material. Is that okay? All right. Okay. Uh, so social networks they are sometimes thought of as these sources of capital, not economic capital, not human capital, which is kind of uh, you know, codified knowledge and education uh, that inheres in the individual. Uh, social networks can bring about what we call social capital. Uh, what do we mean by social capital? It's the uh, resources that you can translate into either economic or human capital uh, that sort of resides in the relationships that you uh, maintain. So if, for example, uh, you know, a child has a very tight relationship with the parents, uh, the parents can, you know, guide and, and uh, give more resources to the child compared to when, you know, the child doesn't have a really strong uh, relationship with, with the parents. Uh, so th those are the sort of resources you get uh, through and uh, by the connections that you have, right? So uh, that's the idea of social capital. So then the natural question that arises is uh, how does the structure or the shapes of your uh, social network have to do with the resources that you can draw from your from your network, the social capital you can uh, get from your network? And uh, one prominent idea here is that uh, having a, a more diverse network uh, with with more connections and knowing more people. Uh, uh, and just having a more diverse set of uh, alters, your, your neighbors, uh, is beneficial for, for a couple of reasons. Okay. Um, and this, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the, the actual uh, benefits in a moment. Uh, but this, these benefits, um, can, yeah. So speaking of that, um, if I could uh, just talk about the, the structural holes paper, which is like relevant to this part. Oh, sure. The, the second paper, Ron Burt? The second one, yeah. Okay, okay, great. All right. Um, so, so these benefits can uh, pertain to different levels. Uh, it can pertain to the individual, right? Individuals can draw benefits from their social relationships. Uh, and it can also benefit uh, groups, right? Uh, the tighter or cohesive group that you can uh, maintain with, with the group members that can, you know, it can increase uh, teamwork and, and uh, efficiency and uh, creativity and all these uh, benefits that uh, pertain to the group level. Okay. Uh, and those those benefits again are coming from uh, your relationships, the the uh, among the members, right? Um, and then lastly, there's uh, entire network level. Uh, you can think of these as, you know, uh, larger social units such as countries. Um, and uh, even at the country level, you can uh, countries can benefit from uh, certain types and and um, certain types of structures uh, of social networks. So today we're going to mostly look at the ego network level and the Thai level. Um, so uh, the two papers that uh, are related to this idea of social capital 
is the one written by uh, Mark Branavetter, the Strength of Weak Ties. Uh, there he, uh, he develops this idea of network bridges, uh, which, are, which are, you know, the ties that uh, connect and uh, work as these, you know, resource uh, uh, pipes, okay. Um, and then the second reading uh, by Ron Burt, uh, he develops a similar idea about how relationships uh, can be beneficial to, to individuals, but he's here looking at the individual as the bridge, not the tie, right? So Rana Vedder is focusing on the tie between two people as a bridge. Uh, uh, Ron Burt is sort of treating the individual as a bridging uh, or a brokering uh, position between different groups of people. Um, those two are related concepts, uh, both are you know, about bridging, but because we're talking about different units of analysis, uh, the, the sort of metrics that get developed and um, the, the uh, applications in terms of you know, what, what they uh, try to study uh, with these different approaches can differ a little bit. Um, so, oh yeah, um, we, we have the Silk Road here and uh, the, the merchants uh, who were you know, traveling uh, across the, the continents, uh, they were taking this as a bridge. Uh, new informations, cultures, artifacts uh, were introduced through, through this bridge. Okay. Um, but the second position where you, you um, look at the individual as the, as the bridge, uh, it can look something like this. Here we have uh, Dylan's mobility service map. So uh, these are the points on the map where Dylan uh, visited. And uh, you can think of Dylan as kind of connecting these different uh, points on the map. He's a sort of, a, you know, a, a bridge, uh, so to speak. Okay, so uh, similar ideas, but, but different units of, of analysis. Okay, uh, Mark Granovetter. Uh, he, his, his paper that, that we read to, uh, this, for this class is uh, one of the most highly cited uh, papers in the social sciences, uh, very influential. And uh, he comes up with an interesting observation that uh, you, you tend to find important and useful information through your uh, acquaintances people that you don't interact with, uh, usually don't interact with, with uh, very often. Um, so his dissertation at, at Harvard was all about uh, where people got uh, job information. Right? So he, he did this survey and um, uh, yeah, it actually showed me the, uh, what are these called? The punch cards? The, the punch cards uh, that he used for, for data collection. Um, he let me take a picture of that, <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. Um, but so he just basically surveyed a, a little uh, town in Massachusetts, I think, and uh, found out that, hey, people uh, just bump into somebody, some acquaintance, and just uh, out of nowhere, they, they receive the uh, information about new job openings. Um, and that accounted for the size of a proportion of, of uh, the, the information stores as acquaintances. So it's a, it was a puzzle for him. So how's that possible? You, you don't see these people, acquaintances um, very often, and yet uh, the useful and important information kind of uh, flow through them, flow through those, those connections. So it's a puzzle. Um, and his, idea here is that those acquaintances, the, the weak ties, even though they're weak, um, they have these relational, well, relationally speaking, they're weak, uh, but structurally speaking, uh, they are these really strong ties. They uh, connect different communities and therefore uh, you can get uh, those informations through these weak ties. The reason why uh, these information bridges or social bridges are, are weak. Well, that's simply because um, if you have a strong tie with somebody, your, your best friend, 
uh, you're going to spend a lot of time with that person. And uh, just by chance, because you're spending so much time, you're going to be introduced to that person's friends, um, your friend's friends, and you're going to introduce some of your friends to, to your best friend. Uh, and so there's going to be this, um, the, the relationship uh, triangle will sort of close. Right? So if A and B are the best friends, A has a friend, a good friend C, uh, is also a really good friend. Um, and if there isn't a tie between B and C, uh, that causes some psychological or uh, uh, cognitive dissonance, so to speak, right? It, you don't feel a, a relational or structural balance in the relationship. So, um, you know, I, I think my, a friend of my friend should, should also be friends, but if they're not friends, then um, there's a tendency to resolve that either by breaking a relationship or really trying to uh, make the connection um, uh, possible. Uh, so what that, when that happens with, with the strong ties, uh, you're going to get redundant information from the same people, right? Imagine that there is a, a tie here. A will hear, well, if C uh, receives new information from outside this, this, this relational triangle, um, C is going to talk about it to A as well as to B. And B, not knowing that C already told A, he's going to talk about it to uh, tell A about it. Or they're just going to discuss uh, you know, that matter um, on the basis that they both you know, know about it. So nothing really new. You're, you're getting redundant information from your uh, strong ties. So uh, he makes that assumption that strong ties uh, tend to be uh, embedded ties, meaning that you, you, you have this uh, triadic closure uh, going on, uh, whereas weak ties tend to be the bridging ties uh, that can give you access to um, uh, informational resources that are far away, socially speaking. Okay. Um, and then, so he developed this measure of uh, the, the bridging uh, bridging capacity of a tie he called local bridge of degree n. So uh, if this is the focal relationship A and B, um, this tie is a, a local bridge of degree, uh, was it 14 or 17? Basically the, the shortest path to get to B from A if this relationship didn't exist, right? That's the length or the bridging capacity uh, of that tie. Um, interestingly, he proposed this in the, the paper, The Strength of Weak Ties, the, the publication. And when I spoke with him when, the day that I took the, snapped those, those pictures, um, I told him that my whole you know, dissertation is uh, using this measure, which has been forgotten for like 50 years. Um, he didn't recognize the, the measure. He, he totally <laughs> forgot about it. I'm like, <laughs> Mark, that you you created this measure, right? He's like, right. So uh, I guess you know when, once you're really established, you don't go back and read your your old papers. <laughs> uh, so that's that's fun. Um, anyways, uh, just to kind of plug in my my little uh, contribution here. Uh, those, so, uh, wait, so uh, these local bridges of degree N, I just call them tie range. Uh, same measurement, the second shortest path length um, from any two nodes that are connected. Um, these long range ties are surprisingly rare. Okay? Uh, if you take the Twitter networks, the communication networks, uh, of Twitter on, in different countries, which are shown in the left pan, uh, panel here. Uh, on the right side, you have these uh, phone call communication networks. Uh, the y-axis is just the probability of observing uh, a tie range at, of x, right? Um, and you know, it's log scale, so it's like you know, pretty quickly um, uh, diminishing. So uh, by tie range like eight or nine, uh, you can rarely observe these um, in, in the population. Okay. So 
Brandeveter was really thinking big when he drew this thing and gave the example of a 317 local bridge. I, I couldn't find any local bridges of degree uh, 17. Um, um, even with, with these large population scale networks with uh, 40 million plus users or, or phone uh, subscribers, phone lines. So um, that's that. It's very rare to observe these uh, long range ties, but you can imagine the, um, uh, the freshness of, of the information that you would be getting through these ties. They're just so far away from you, socially speaking. Um, you probably, you know, don't even share the same sort of schema uh, to interpret and, and you know, it, uh, interpret the information that you're receiving from them. Um, so that's one worry, but, you know, it, you know, I, I find that uh, as tie range increases, it doesn't necessarily the tie strength doesn't necessarily decrease. Um, it actually increases as tie range decreases. Uh, so that that kind of signifies that uh, even if it's really long range and um, you're socially distant, uh, you can still have lots of conversation, uh, frequent conversation such that uh, the, the use of the information is uh, not as small. Um, compared to when you have a really weak tie with that person. So uh, that was a little contribution. Um, oh, here it is. I was looking for this. Um, yeah, so th this is the tie range on the x-axis. We have uh, the communication frequency on the y-axis, call volume, mention frequency. Um, and beyond tie range three, uh, you see this, this uptrend. Uh, the tie strength or frequency of communication is, is increasing. Okay. Uh, let's turn to brokerage, uh, Ron Bird. If I can just uh, give a little introduction. Ron Bird, he also is a big uh, name in social network analysis. He was a, a professor at the Booth School of Business at the University of Chicago. He basically just you know established the cottage industry and in, uh, within social network analysis and the literature, uh, just a lot of papers coming out using uh, Ron Burt's uh, measure of uh, network constraint or, or the brokerage potential, which uh, Eli will be talking about. Uh, yeah, um, do you need to like share your screen? I don't have slides or anything. I just have okay. notes jotted down, which I took actually after the talk today because I thought it was an interesting contrast from the talk today. Um, so the paper that I read uh, was um, this Ron Burt, um, Structural Holes and Good Ideas. And so in the introduction, he says, uh, we know that opinion and behavior are more homogenous within a group than between groups. Um, but we don't have evidence on uh, how the between how interacting between groups like affects someone's output, someone's ideas, or um, their their success, and so these people that facilitate between group conversation, he labels as brokers, and there's four different levels that he describes a broker can do. So one is like the simplest is uh, make each group aware of each other's interests and, and difficulties. And then the most complex is to synthesize everything both groups are doing and uh, to, to mutually benefit both of them. And, and benefit yourself as well, right? Arbitrage. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so he, the way that he approaches this is through a network science perspective. And he goes into this uh, large American electronics company and surveys um, 673 managers there uh, of which the majority of them responded, and he discovered 4,000 relationships between all of these managers. And uh, in a general sense, these relationships are mostly clusters and then bridges, so like clusters of each business unit, and then occasionally there'll be someone who bridges multiple business units together. And the long story short is managers who acted as brokers and connected 
business units that otherwise wouldn't be connected, they were rewarded with higher compensation, higher performance evaluations, and they're more likely to be promoted. And they also, another interesting uh, result of the study is they made each um, survey respondent submit a sort of like hypothetical idea for how to improve the business. And then they had two judges rate if this idea was going to be good or valuable for the company. And what they found was, uh, even though they anonymized all these responses, the brokers in the network were more likely to have a quote unquote good idea that was valuable to the company. And so the conclusion is, being a broker and, and receiving diverse ideas enables you to be more creative and more productive and successful, which I thought was interesting. And I thought it was a little bit somewhat contradictory to like what we heard at lunch today, where Can you like we're... summarize it a little bit for Yeah, yeah, more? sure. So we had a lunch talk today with um, a professor from University of Pittsburgh, I think. And he said that um, online teams are less likely to be disruptive in their research than in-person teams. That was the that was pretty much the whole talk. Um, and I thought that was interesting because it's kind of contradictory with the idea that diversity and diverse uh, perspectives and backgrounds produces better ideas, right? And so I'm wondering how can we resolve this tension? Like, like what, what's, what's true? I'm sure both are true, but there's some sort of complexity there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, with remote uh, collaborations, geographically remote, you, you have to rely on Zoom or these communication tools. And uh, the sort of um, uh, really the new ideas, like innovative ideas, tend to come out of uh, teams that actually meet face to face in the same uh, area, uh, and the uh, the remote teams tend to uh, produce more. They're more sort of exploitation rather than exploration um, in, in their efforts uh, with regards to doing science. Um, and so the sort of contradiction, if you will, is that if you have uh, remote teams, they are presumably you know, tapping into different idea spaces and resources and cultures. Uh, and so then when they come together to collaborate and produce something, then they, shouldn't they have you know, better ideas? Is the is right, that's uh, my intuition. That's your intuition. I had a similar uh, thought about that, um, but of course, I think he, what he's trying to, the, what the talk was about was uh, underlying the um, idea was that you you really need to have um, uh, more more than just a communication channel to be able to produce knowledge that is not easily codified, right? Codified knowledge is uh, the knowledge that you can just you know, get from a manual or, or it's pretty standard uh, knowledge and information that you can um, incorporate into your, uh, uh, into your knowledge base pretty easily. Uh, but when you're trying to develop a, something or an idea that's truly disruptive, uh, that requires a lot of tacit knowledge transfers, um, which probably really needs a lot of, uh, more than just you know, digital communication. You, you really need to be uh, you know, in, in flesh, right? You, you gotta, uh, all sorts of nonverbal cues and these, these uh, communications that go on um, in a face-to-face -face situation is probably uh, really important. I think that was my sort of takeaway and interpretation uh, of that. Uh, but I think, you know, in, in general, the, uh, the idea of having uh, diverse teams and, and um, sort of, um, enhancing diversity in your networks uh, is beneficial as, uh, for example, good ideas. Anything else you'd, you'd like to add? Um, there were 
was one other interesting conclusion that the author made, which is that a formal chain of command is important and beneficial, at least in this study, for enabling this brokerage between business units. And I thought that was interesting, and, and I, I'm still trying to reason as to why that would be the case. You need a formal chain of command. Like, they, he mentions multiple times, like, a hierarchical structure is more, was more effective in this study than if the teams, if it was more flat power dynamic. Mm. Why do you think uh, that's the case? Is it uh, some characteristic or aspect of the, the task at hand? I think the author mentioned that if there's a main headquarters or a, or a manager who works in that role, then it's easier to, to have information go up to this manager and then go to another place and, and outside of your in-group. So when you when uh, you have that kind of tree structure, communication then becomes more efficient mm -hmm. because uh, you don't have to like uh, there are less uh, links that are required for everybody to be connected to everybody else in in the organization, right? You just need to go up the ladder and then come down if you reach. Um, so that that means at the individual level, you just need to maintain one tie with your boss, for example, or with a few teammates rather than um, trying to foster all these relationships uh, across different units and so on. So uh, you know, th there's some, some truth to that, I guess, but uh, th there, there are a lot of network studies that emphasize the importance of informal social networks um, uh, that kind of sometimes complement and sometimes even subvert uh, the formal organizational structure, the organization chart. Um, so I guess, it, yeah, it, it, again, context dependence, right? Yeah. <laughs> We're talking about that a lot on, these days. Uh, anything else that did you kind of think of uh, potential research uh, ideas from, from reading this paper? Well, when I, when I was reading it, I was mostly focused on the, the lunch talk, and maybe I would be interested in redoing this similar study, but in a different organization that is less, because, um, okay, so another, another thing that I was interested in is a good idea was labeled as good if it provided value to the company, and I think that people who are more senior in the company and perhaps also more likely to then be a broker because they're more well connected, know better what is gonna be labeled as valuable. Uh. Whereas like a, you know, a, a, someone that was hired a week ago just simply could have, could have great ideas and could be brilliant but doesn't know what the CEO is really looking for. And I think it would be interesting to see in a different organization or with a different definition of a good idea uh, is this, uh, is brokerage still valuable mm -hmm. in, in, at the same level? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the, there's, there are studies um, that show that uh, these brokerage uh, roles or positions, people who are in, in high brokerage uh, positions measured by low network constraints, which we'll be talking about a little bit in a while, um, th those, those who span uh, these structural holes and with high brokerage scores, uh, they are met with a lot of suspicion and uh, a doubt in some Chinese companies. It, it, th th there's a cultural uh, explanation uh, that they put forth, it's, uh, as well as a structural uh, contextual explanation. but. Um, first of all, there's, uh, how should I put it? I can't, I'm trying to remember exactly what they said. Uh, in, in the Chinese context, a subordinate who is trying to broker or bridge different units, um, that's seen as pretty abnormal and, uh, Brokerage positions are by structure or almost by nature 
prone to uh, suspicion because these people uh, are kind of bridging and, and they, they can have potential arbitrage benefits by being in the middle of this information, you know, uh, ecosystem or, or you know the, the social worlds, um, and so there's always the question about identity. Uh, are you you know one of us or are you are you not? Like go out to the job market and if you sell uh, yourself or market yourself as uh, you know you know saddling two different or you know more than two uh, areas of research. If you don't do it right, then you know you, you get shot down pretty quickly. Um, uh, at interviews. So, um, first of all, you got to be savvy to, to be able to pull that off, um, which requires a certain type of, like, you know, social intelligence and, and uh, personality traits. Um, but, yeah, depending on culture and uh, work context, whether uh, the task is inherently interdependent like, you know, team members really have to rely on each other uh, for, for their own task to be completed, right? In, in those situations versus um, in, in work context where uh, your work is largely independent uh, from other, uh, you know, team members' work, right? That makes a difference in, in the brokerage um, effectiveness as well. So yeah, there are all these like contingencies and, and um, uh, uh, moderating uh, factors. But what Ron Bird is uh, consistently showing is that, yeah, uh, across the different contexts, whether it's good ideas, getting promoted, uh, or, or um, you know, getting a raise, all these, these uh, performance measures are highly correlated with uh, the brokerage position uh, that one is in. Okay, um, a little bit on the, the measurement because this was this is used a lot. So when we talk about brokerage, Robert here is, is uh, in a brokerage position bridging different uh, groups of people, right? Um, and in, in some sense, Robert is uh, filling in holes between groups. There's a hole between this group and this group because uh, there are no other connections. Robert is kind of filling that hole, the structural hole. Um, and how do you measure the, these uh, structural holes? Um, Ron Bird gives, uh, developed this uh, notion of network constraint. Um, and network constraint is simply the uh, the relative strength of the tie between um, an individual. So in this case, if I is the focal actor, focal no node, um, and you're trying to measure how much uh, constrained I is by J, that is computed as, uh, first of all, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a function of the relative strength of this relationship. So the stronger the relationship, um, uh, uh, the more constrained you, you are going to be, right? You rely more on that person for information and all these things, right? So that, that kind of constrains you structurally. That's PIJ, um, yeah. Uh, and then the other component is the sum of PIQ and PQJ where Q um, is the third party uh, nodes that kind of, you know, uh, that, that are, uh, who are um, kind of mediating the relationship between I and J. Um, so that's the third party. So that's Q. If you take the relative uh, tie strength of I and Q and uh, Q to J, uh, you, you multiply them and you sum it up across all the Qs. Uh, that's basically the, the constraint. The, the, maybe I should move on to the next slide. Uh, so, so the intuition is that the more cues you have and the more uh, strong ties that uh, these cues have with both I and, and J, 
um, it just means that th they have a more influence on how information or uh, relationships are, are being defined and information is transferred and, and relationships defined in the context. So uh, the stronger the these, these third party ties to Qs, uh, the more constrained I is towards J. Um, and so this measure, when you square it, it, it sort of represents uh, three different uh, ideas. So the constraint measure is uh, a, a function of size of the network of I, uh, the density uh, of I's ego network, and uh, lastly, the hierarchy that exists. Um, in relation to I, I, I and J. If you have a low constraint, is it possible to say it's because of a low size but not a low density or vice versa? Or is it not possible to like distinguish between those three? You, well, according to this, you can distinguish, right? Uh, you usually just take the, the summary measure, the, the composite measure, uh, and that's sufficient. But if you wanna drill down like exactly where is the constraint coming from, um, you can just, you know, uh, expand this and, and get uh, something that looks like this, right? Uh, Pij squared, this is just uh, the, um, how should I put it? Uh, Pij squared is going to, uh, it's a relative, right? So um, Pij squared is going to be, you know, to drop more quickly um, when Pij is small, mm. right? When you, when your denominator is, is large, uh, it's going to drop more quickly, and so uh, that's going to reduce Cij. Uh, Pij times Piq times Pqj. These are the sort of triangle terms, right? You have the relationship between i and j, the, the strength, uh, the strength of Iq, the relationship, the, the one in the top and QJ, uh, so it's the, the triangle term. Like how much influence uh, do these embedded relationships in the Qs uh, determine or influence the, the amount of constraint uh, of I uh, with regard to J? And then lastly, you have PIQ uh, and PQJ squared. Um, this, this, is, this kind of represents hierarchy so if you kind of disregard this relationship uh, and you're just looking at the indirect uh, connections from I to J, assuming that there's no connection here, then you have to go through Q, right? So the, the uh, relative strength of IQ times QJ, um, that's basically the, the hierarchy term. Okay. So, um, oops, yeah, I should have shown this first. Um, so that's just a Cij, but when you uh, sum all the Cijs across all Js, right, uh, across all your, your directly connected neighbors, that becomes your composite or overall uh, constraint score. So uh, the, the larger the constraint score, the less uh, brokerage position you are in. Um, so, and you already talked about the, the good ideas. It really comes down to vision advantage. Uh, you, you can see and hear things that uh, other people who are not so well connected uh, cannot see. Um, and this is just showing the, the results. So you have uh, the constraint scores at the, on the x-axis. Um, and the, the performance metrics on, on the y-axis, like good ideas, uh, evaluation of good ideas. As constraint increases, your, the evaluation kind of uh, de decreases overall. Uh, same story. Um, and these brokerage positions are not just a, a, a phenomenon uh, within organizations. If you look at entire nation states, 
um, using, for example, the, the uh, phone call network data from, uh, from the UK, um, you, you find this correlation with the R square almost 0.9, I think, uh, uh, between the diversity measure, like brokerage, um, and the socioeconomic uh, well-being at the area code level. Right? So if you take the, the network, the phone call network brokerage scores from a given area and correlate that score, the average score with uh, you know, different types of economic indicators at that area level, you see this, there's a strong correlation. So it's not just organization, it's the nation states as well. Um, so, one other thing I want to mention about brokerage is that Ron Bird has really uh, has a strong influence on how we think about uh, network diversity and, and brokerages, the, the benefits we can get from brokerages. But uh, there are other thoughts that somewhat counter uh, Ron Bird's theory, which is uh, one of it is by David Crackhart at the, at uh, Heinz here, he's at CMU. Um, he came up with this idea of Zemelian ties. Uh, I think I talked about it a little bit yesterday during my talk. Um, you, you have these three different um, structures. So in which one do you think ego is most or, or least constrained? In other words, have uh, most autonomy and uh, filling structural holes. 2A, 2B, 2C. A, right. And why is that? Because that is the one where ego acts most as a broker between A, B, and C can be. Right, the other ones don't have connections to, to one another. Right. And so, uh, Ego is least constrained there. What about here and here? Which one is more constrained? Constraining. So here, everybody's connected to everybody else. Here, it's kind of a bow tie network. Um, you, you have a, a triangle on this side and another triangle on the other side of, uh, with ego in the middle. Ron Berg would say, this is uh, this is more constrained than, than in this situation, uh, and if you actually compute the the constraint score, it, that's how it comes out. But what Crackhart is um, arguing is that, well, you know, this situation can be uh, even more constraining, depending on the situation. Again, context, <laughs> uh, and that is because if ego has strong ties to all of them. Um, you can think of the AC ego as one sort of subgroup, and then ego BD as another subgroup, uh, and they're all like tightly knit. Um, maybe there's no, there is a reason why uh, there are no cross-cutting ties between uh, these two groups. And um, ego might feel more constrained to be in, in a situation where everybody is present. Like, whose side are you on? You know, that kind of thing. Right? Uh, allegiance and um, maybe there are different, different norms that govern these, these two different groups. And uh, those differences and how ego acts differently based on those norms uh, will be, be uh, visible to everybody, which puts ego in a really you know, uh, difficult situation. So Crackhart argues that uh, the third example, that, that's the most constraining for ego. So there, you know, uh, they, they are, there are different uh, theories and, and you know, I think they all are valid. Uh, you just need to uh, really think through uh, which theory or which idea pertains to uh, the, the situation that you're, you're studying. Uh, romantic relationships, let's, let's see back from uh, Kleinberg. Uh, do 
I need to stop sharing my screen? Who is presenting for this paper? Matt. Yeah, that's me. So you probably should stop sharing and let Matt share the screen if Matt has the slide. Oh, wow. Okay. It says I'm sharing right now. Can you guys see me? We see the screen. Uh, we started hearing you just now. <laughs> You guys want me to, yeah, yeah, ready to begin. So I'm talking, okay, sounds good. So I'm talking about romantic partnerships and the dispersion of social ties and network analysis of relationship status on Facebook. Uh, so we all know that, um, <clears throat> so we all know that uh, there are some things that we really don't care that social networks know about, you know, like cuddling up with your Snuggie, you know, and watching your favorite movies. Um, there are some things that uh, you'd probably rather not have social media know about, like you have a crush on Martha Stewart. And there's some things that are none of their business, right? And so, you know, the the key points about this paper, they wanted to find out, you know, can we predict a person's romantic partners just based on the network structure alone? And they used uh, Facebook data as a data source. Um, I'm sure everyone consented to that, right? And um, you know, then the contribution is a measure called dispersion that the authors posit as a theoretical predictor of romantic partners. And, and what dispersion is, it, it describes the dissimilarity of strongly related individual connections. And so the intuition is kind of, you know, if you have a romantic partner, um, you tend to have strong ties with that partner, but, you know, each of you have uh, different social foci, so uh, different, different friend groups. And they evaluated that by, um, you, know, uh, um, you know, comparing that. Okay, so let's see. So, you know, a, a couple of things to think about, you know, because there was a, um, you know, to what extent, if any, does it kind of creep you out, you know, that Facebook wants to know who your, you know, romantic partners are? Does it creep you guys out a lot or a little? Kind of what's kind of hard to see a show of hands, but, um, you know, how, what, what do you guys think about that? How creeped out are you? Anybody really creeped out? Anybody not creeped out at all? Sorry, <laughs> Say it again. There are, there are a lot of ways that Facebook can figure out who you're and how, like what your relations are beyond social network structure. So I don't know. Maybe that's just because I do privacy research, so I know a lot about it. But yeah, because one of the things, yeah, because one of the things they compared against, right, is that uh, you know folks can you know, register their relationship on Facebook. And, you know, that was kind of their, their control, right? You know, they would try to, you know, identify it based on, you know, the network structure. And then, you know, they would compare that against the, um, you know, what people had, had, had communicated was their, uh, you know, was their, uh, you know, relationship. Um, so, you, you know, so I think, think you had mentioned that, um, you know, researching privacy, you, you kind of see there are a couple of different ways that they could, they could pull this off. Um, but you know, did anybody have a strong reaction or, or none at all? Anybody think this is great or not so great? I'm indifferent. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like maybe the expectation is to be creeped out, but I personally not. So what's the part that the that this could possibly creep somebody out? In your opinion, Matt? Oh, I th I think there are a lot of different ways, right? Um, you know, I I think that you know, being able to, you know, connect social partners, um, you know, being able to correlate, you know, activity online, you know, with who your partners are, um, you know, I, I think that is, uh, uh, you know, gives a, gives a lot of information, right? Um, 
So it's information that you don't necessarily want to share with, uh, with the company or with uh, any of your friends on Facebook, and yet uh, the company is able to infer with uh, fairly high accuracy uh, who your romantic partner could be. Yep. Okay. Yep. I can see, I, like, I'm, I guess I'm leaning towards being against this now. If, if they're inferring it based on things that you don't, like, if you submit who your romantic partner is, then I don't really think it's that bad. But if they're inferring it based off of, like, network characteristics, then I think that's pretty bad. Especially if you're in a situation where, like, you would be put in danger if people found out, like, who your romantic partner is. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's exactly right, right? Yeah. So, so why do we think Facebook might want to invest in research to know who our romantic partners are? That's a good question. What do you think? So they can better target advertising. <laughs> I mean, that's why Facebook does everything. I feel like, um, yeah. So better advertising, targeted advertising. Yeah, I mean, if they know you have a partner who is like a golfer or something, they could recommend you golf bags around Black Friday. You know, uh, I mean, yeah, there are a lot of, if they can make that connection, they well, can. That's so smart. Yes, it's such a good idea. Mm. <laughs> yeah, you know, your, uh, you know, coordinated advertising, right? I mean that that seems like a pretty, you know, pretty compelling, you know, use case for them. You know, uh, you know, advertise one product, you know, around, you know, a birthday or a holiday, you know, to uh, one significant up, you know, to one romantic partner and to the other one as well. You know, hey, you know, if you were, uh, you know, if your, uh, uh, you know, partner really loves you, they'll give you this, you know, fancy Cartier watch, right? <laughs> And then, you know, to the other partner, wow, you know, if you really love them, you'll buy them this, uh, you know, fancy Cartier watch, right? Um, you know, I'm just kind of basing that on the, you know, just, you know, there's a, I think there's a billboard out in front of TCS right now talking about Cartier watches, right? Um, but, you know, so advertising, um, you know, does Facebook have a good reason to infer this data? Do you think that's a, what do you guys think about that? Is targeted advertising, is that a good reason to kind of, you know, dig through your data? And... That's, that's their business model, right? That's their yeah. business model. Yeah, that's right. So if, you can, if, it, if, it, if they made it obvious they were doing that, and if they gave you an opt-out, I'm not necessarily against it. Well, let's remember that these are, uh, this is a highly accurate guess that Facebook is making based on the information they already have about spouse or romantic partners. You know, they, they give you the space to, to pinpoint who your partner is in your profile page. So they have a lot of information to begin with, and they're just using the network data to see if they can uh, guess the, the uh, make a more accurate guess, right? So it's not like they're um, probing, you know, uh, more, more data. It's just they're using their data, just like any other, other like machine learning uh, task, even if it doesn't um, uh, involve network information, right? Uh, would you feel creeped out if um, just based on all the information or the posts that you uh, put up on, on Facebook and uh, they're able to predict your, um, I don't know, sexual preference or, or even just, you know, uh, who's your spouse and things like that uh, accurately would, I mean, we should be freaking out uh, for every single sensitive uh, information that Facebook is inferring from, from the troves of, of data they have. I would say. I will say this is also like one, not unique. Lots of companies do this. If you have a membership card anywhere to like CVS or something, they keep track of your purchases and use that to target things at you. So if this scares you, then I think a lot of things about how the world is 
should I was going to say, I think I'm just numbed. <laughs> numbed. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe you should pray for a free world to, to I don't know, emerge. <laughs> but I mean, the other point is like with this sort of stuff is this is all getting into like the philosophy of like privacy and what is consent and stuff like that. So it's almost, yeah. yeah. It, it's a, a really important topic and I, I teach, I, I like have a whole uh, class uh, for my undergraduate class on um, you know ethic research ethics uh, specifically with with these digital and network data so that's an important topic uh, but what, what I wanted to kind of what, the reason why I included this is because this paper is almost like a, a exemplar of how you combine social scientific insights with really creative uh, uh, quantitative uh, measuring or coming up with operationalizations. So, um, Matt, are you, are you almost done? Can I share my uh, screen? Uh, yeah, I, I can be done if we want to stop here. No, no, no. If you still, I, I thought this was this was it. <laughs> oh, I I can keep going, <laughs> but I'll I'll stop. Okay. All right. Uh, sorry. Um. Um, oh, this is the wrong slide. Uh, that's not exciting. This is all screwed up. Or was it? Yeah. Because I can't like find the. Is it not the, the the second to last window oh, at the very second bottom? Second to last, this one. Yeah, I think I opened this one. Oh, oh. Yeah, this should be it. No. Yeah, this but I think you're it. sharing the right window, but the window that's on top is not that window. Oh. Okay. Well, that's not it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I yeah. I'll, Uh, yes, but the class will end in 10 minutes. Can we wait for 10 minutes or uh, do you want to? Um, okay, that's fine. I just have to go to another pickup. Okay, can there. I do the other one first? Because this one is not urgent. Okay. Okay, All thank right. you. So this should be it. Oh, okay, there we go. So. Uh, I'll just get into to the really make it brief. Um, so the authors obviously read a lot of uh, psychology of, of partners and uh, intimate relationships. Uh, they you know cite some some influential articles in that area. Uh, they kind of distill these uh, characteristics of in, intimate intimate ties. Excuse me. Um, and what's the most important in terms of uh, structural characteristics of networks is that an interest in being together as much as possible through interactions in multiple social contexts over a long period of uh, period um, is one of the important characteristics of uh, intimate ties. So if you think about what this means, if you try to visualize this, It's something like this. So this is you, this is your partner, but Facebook doesn't know yet. Uh, and uh, this is your friendship, your Facebook friendship network, right? What they're saying or the, the intuition that they're kind of leveraging here is that um, as a couple, you're, you're kind of treating this as a unit. It's one unit rather than two people. So if you treat it as one unit, then what are the uh, surrounding relationships or, or you know, people, rather, uh, that can be only bridged through 
this unit. We talked about brokerage, right? Brokerage is like, okay, I'm here. You two are not uh, directly connected. You have to go through me. That's brokerage, an individual, right? One node. But when you become a couple, you're sort of doing that kind of brokering as a unit. So all the sort of um, combinations or, or the, the possible uh, connections that exist around this relationship to the extent that uh, those dyadic uh, pairs need to go through these two, uh, the, the more you have those kinds of pairs, uh, the higher your dispersion score, right? It's like, okay, you, now you're dating um, and you, you know, so let's say that uh, the four and five are like college friends of one, one's going to introduce four and five to, to uh, two, and so they all become Facebook friends, right? Two, um, at another time point, introduces her uh, high school friends, I guess, uh, six and three to one, and so uh, rather, th this is a church friend, let's say, and this is a, a high school friend of two. So one gets to know both of them and uh, they become friends with one. And so now these uh, two friends of number two don't share any other social context with one's friends, right? Uh, there, there's this sort of uh, brokering or bridging that's going on between, the, uh, between uh, the two up there and the two down here through this unit as a unit, right? So if you think about it, um, like your parents, like the, they, uh, they, they always, you know, uh, do activities together or, you know, you, when you're starting uh, dating somebody, you uh, do all these activities together, you're, you're kind of moving in space time together, forging or, or forming relationships uh, as, as a couple. And so, what that kind of entails or the, the imagery that, uh, that is uh, created is something like this. And the network dispersion measure is trying to capture that. Right? So here you have uh, the, the dispersion measure of U and V is uh, the sum of the, uh, this, this distance measure D uh, with, with regards to S, node S and node T who are both connected to U and V. So if there is um, no direct connection between S and T other than through, uh, through U and V, then you increment that measure by one. Uh, otherwise it's zero. So you just you know, tally the number of S T pairs uh, that satisfy this condition and that's your dispersion measure. So, uh, you co compute that dispersion measure for two, for six, three, five, and four, everybody who's connected to one. Uh, and whoever has the highest dispersion measure is probably uh, the, the uh, romantic partner. Yeah. Kind of like that intuition. Um, and you know they, they kind of develop more sophisticated uh, approaches built on top of that, but uh, we don't need to go into that, the, the details. It's just that I wanted to show you uh, how you know this can be done uh, in a cool way? Like how you combine theory and uh, social intuition with with measures and um, uh, network data? Okay. Uh, do we have time? Uh, so I'll make this really quick. Uh, the last reading was on. Uh, sexual partner uh, relationships uh, among high school students, right? So this is the, uh, the dating network at one high school, Jefferson High School. Um, and you find this really interesting ring structure uh, that, that just emerges from the, the you know, partnerships that uh, have been, that, that built over, over the years at this high school. Um, so the question that the authors ask is, how do you come to get this kind of structure? It looks very, very different. Why, why do you have like a ring? It, they call it a spanning tree, right? It's a, it's a spanning tree structure. 
in romantic partnerships or, or uh, uh, you know, dating networks in high school. How is this possible? Right. So this is where the use of uh, random networks uh, come into play. We talked about random graphs, net, what's the use of it, all that. Um, well, it's used as a, a baseline. So you take this empirically observed network, you know each node's degree, and so you can uh, construct a random network where uh, all the, the degrees of each node is preserved. Other than the fact that you know this node has degree one, who this tie goes to um, is completely random, right? So it's a random graph uh, that has some similarities with uh, the observed structure. So when you kind of randomize it, then uh, and, and you, you produce a whole distribution of measures from those random graphs, right? So these are the random graph uh, distributions, density for, for density distribution for random graphs, uh, number of cycles here, um, and then the dots here are the empirically observed quantities, right? Uh, and you know, they, they find this odd um, uh, deviation from, from random, and they kind of dig into that and figure out, oh, okay, so uh, the observed network has a lot of four cycles, meaning that you have four nodes that uh, have this cycle structure, no uh, crisscrossing ties other than that, right? Um, so it's kind of like you know, this, this kind of structure, right? You have Bob dating Carol and Alice dating uh, Ted at time one, and then at time two, Ted and Carol start dating each other. Um, so if then Bob and Alice date each other, then you get this, uh, this four cycle, which is uh, lacking in the empirical network. So then they kind of dig into this, what, what could be going on? They, they don't really successfully explain it rigorously, but uh, just commonsensically, they call it the icky factor, whatever it's called. It's in one of the uh, footnotes. Uh, so basically it's very awkward for either Bob or Alice to date each other since Alice's ex-boyfriend's uh, ex-girlfriend was Bob's girlfriend in the past. It, that's just weird. I guess for, it's weird for, for uh, uh, high school students. So uh, again, it, it's a very interesting use of uh, random networks, random graphs for uh, making sense of the structure and uh, the reason for, for observing particular structures in empirical networks. Uh, do you have any questions? Feel free to uh, let me know. But uh, other than that, so that that example was able to be found because of comparing the empirical network to the random network. Exactly. Yeah. And um, they go on to construct random networks that actually they do have cycles, um, and then. You know, th this is no longer like way out there. 